Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Red Hat Summit 2016. Brought to you by Red Hat. Here's your host, Stu Miniman. Welcome back here at Red Hat Summit 2016. We're in the lobby of Moscone West and at Red Hat, of course, we always get lots of stories about open source and the impact it's having. So I'm happy to have a, a special uh, panel here, actually, uh, that are going to be launching a video later this afternoon, which you can watch here on theCUBE, or if you're at the show, it's going to be on the third floor. So let me walk through the guests that we have here. Uh, sitting next to me is Liz Salmi, who's a brain cancer blogger. Liz, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, uh, we have Dr. John Santa, who's the Director of Open Notes Dissemination at Beth Israel Deaconess. And we also have Amy Fellows, who's an Associate of Community Health Programs, also with Open Notes, uh, Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, Liz, uh, let, let, let's start with you. Uh, we actually, your, your story was told in the keynote. Just give our audience just brief, you know, a little bit about your background and, and what brought you into this. Sure, so my professional background is I'm a digital communicator. I make websites, I design graphics. And one week after my 20th, 29th birthday, I had a big seizure, rushed to the hospital and found out I had a mass in my brain. Lo and behold, it was growing. We found out I had brain cancer. I had a brain surgery. I went through chemotherapy. And throughout that time, I was looking for survivor stories on the internet. You want to, you know, you look up your diagnosis, you Google brain cancer, you see horrible facts out there. And so as somebody with a digital communications background, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go open with my story and be the person I was looking for online to say, hey, I'm a survivor, I'm still alive, and this is what brain surgery is like, and this is what chemotherapy is like, hoping that maybe perhaps other folks might get some value out of the information I had to share. All right, well, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Dr. Santa, why don't you t t tell our audience, you know, what, what is this Open Notes, uh, you know, initiative that you have? Yeah, Open Notes is a movement. Yeah. It's a movement to try and bring openness to the health system. Uh, which is a challenging thing to do because, as Jim Whitehurst said, hierarchies uh, squelch innovation. And I'm sorry, sad to say that uh, in healthcare we have many hierarchies, um, many of which involve physicians um, that have to be convinced uh, to innovate. And so my job in Open Notes is focused on uh, trying to convince predominantly ph physicians and other clinicians it's time to open up your notes. What you're saying in writing makes a big difference when patients read it. 99% of patients like Liz want to see their notes. All right, a a Amy, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the open patient story and, and, and how Be Beth Israel Deacon has got involved? Sure, um, so in 2011, Beth Israel Deaconess did a research study involving three um, systems, uh, Beth Israel in Boston, Geisinger in the Midwest, and Harborview in um, inner city Seattle. And so basically they found the data that Dr. Sander referred to that um, they had 100 primary care providers open up their notes to patients for a year and that 99% of the patients wanted to have continued access. They felt more engaged in their care. They were better able to take their medications. Providers even after offered to stop having their notes open, after the study chose to keep their notes open. And since then, it's become a movement that has spread across the country with now an estimated more than seven million patients having access to their notes across the country. Wow, that, that, that's great. Uh, Dr. Sand, I, I have to believe, you know, it's, it's got to be tough for some doctors. I mean, doctors, you know, you know they, they, they go through all their training. They are the experts on, on, on what they're doing. Uh, to tell us some of the conversations you're having. You know, is, is it a hard sell to get, get them involved in something like this? Well, it varies. I mean, Amy mentioned uh, we're very proud 7 million people have access to their notes, so only 340 million to go. Um, <laughs> so uh, in many communities, there are early adopters, innovators, who um, this, this is what they do, and uh, they gravitate to it. But what we're finding is um, there are many more folks who see the power of it, but they feel the power of those hierarchies that they work in. Um, and it's a stressful environment for some doctors out there. Electronic records have been stressful for them, and they're fearful. Um, and so uh, a lot of our work is focused on trying to overcome those fears and um, to 
as, as again, Jim Whitehurst said this morning, it involves them giving up control, which um, is not to our doctor nature. We want to be in control. Um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to work with health issues that can be very hard to control, and then when you get people issues that, you know, take some of that control away. So doctors are fearful, and we're working hard to overcome that. Yeah, so Liz, you know, give us, give us the patient uh, side of things here. Um, you know, I, I mean, with healthcare, people are worried about security. They're worried about, you know, oversharing, you know, uh, certain things. You know, obviously, you've, you've got a great story, uh, but there's, there's got to be a little bit of fear for some people, too, getting involved in something like this. Yeah, um, so for patients, not every patient is going to want to approach their healthcare story the same way I do. And, and not every patient wants to read every single note their doctor might write about them after an appointment, but some do. And no one has ever died from a Google search, but the paradigm is changing away around people are consuming healthcare. If we um, are interested in a new diet or, or the new Fitbit technology, we're going to look up re reviews from other people who are engaging with that product. Same is going on with healthcare. And the, the future is that we want to, we see ourselves at the same level as our providers. We want to be participants in our care. And what's so great about Open Notes is after you have that visit with your provider, you, you actually can go and read and remember what they said. Not everybody brings a notebook into the doctor's office and writes down the exact conversation. So to be able to go back and read your provider's recommendations actually keeps patients um, on track with 99% of patients, didn't you say, end mm -hmm. up, not only do they like to read what the notes are, but they're more likely to um, do what the doctor is recommending and take the medication in the right way and take the advice that their provider has given to them. And so and this is just the future where, every, where any industry is going and healthcare just needs to keep up with that. Yeah, uh, I, I have to think even just alone, you know, making sure, digitizing it, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, the handwriting or kind of the chain of, uh, you know, information being sharing, you know, uh, anything you can share about, you know, additional benefits that the participants uh, for, from the, the healthcare side have gotten from participating in the open notes? Um, there's a there's a quality and safety issue because yeah. who knows better what's happening mm -hmm. with the patient than the patient themselves. So there are errors that can be found when the patient has access to their own information. Um, and, and really this is giving the patient access to their own information. It's not a security issue in terms of giving it to anyone else but themselves. So, so they're able to review that and catch any errors that might have been and I just want to add on to that. Mm -hmm. That is so important that the patient can see their own notes and their own medical record. Um, the errors thing is a big deal. I, I have a relationship with many other patients, and they find errors such as um, in the medical record, it would say, your, a friend of mine found that her husband's name was actually written down as her father's name. So who can make medical decisions when they might lose capacity? Um, certain allergies to medications aren't recorded that should be recorded, and that could be a big no, you know, a disaster in case of an emergency. Okay. Uh, can, can you speak to just the adoption and how, how you get more, uh, more people into this program? Well, uh, we're working with multiple um, software vendors and developers who are, are essentially building these electronic medical record tools. And um, so they have to be willing to support open notes. And many of them, but not all by any means, um, have done so. So the enthusiasm of those software folks uh, to support open notes is important. Um, then we have to get the doctors to agree um, uh, to do this. And um, one key um, issue is well, uh, that they think they're uh, going to end up having to work more, that they'll get overwhelmed with emails. And actually, that's not the case. In fact, we think there may be less emails. A second is they're worried, oh, well, they're going to see these errors and they're not going to love me. That's not true. Actually, we think that when patients are given this kind of information, um, uh, they trust their doctors more. The relationship grows, even if there are errors, because uh, they say to themselves, this is great. My doctor's trying uh, his or her best to have the best information. And, and what doctor would want to have incorrect information um, about a patient. So, so it all works out 
We've done multiple implementations now across the country for those seven million folks. It all works out and it works out well, but getting people to trust that it will um, is uh, hard work. Yeah, uh, I mean, Liz, uh, that, that, that trust factor has to be something that, uh, you know, is, is pretty important. Uh, so any other uh, commentary you want to share on uh, how, how Open Notes helps patients? Well, uh, you know, when you're diagnosed with something serious or, you, or, you, or a chronic condition, um, as a patient, you're already looking to your clinician as the expert, and you don't know what you can do. And so you say, tell me what I need to do. And then we go back in secret on our own and Google stuff and look things up on the internet, and then we bring things back to our provider and say, hey, I heard of this thing, or, you know, and we all do it because we're all patients. So with something like Open Notes, it allows uh, that conversation to happen outside. We can continue having a conversation, or you can remember what the provider said, and it's not like like you can only have these conversations with them um, at, at the clinic or at in the actual hospital. You can remember what they said, and you might be able to go back to them and, and give them, you know, start that two-way conversation about uh, uh, what it is that you're learning. And and to what you said about you know clinicians who are might opt into an open source thing, being concerned they're going to get too many emails or communicated with too much, um, just knowing your provider is there um, is just a helpful, reassuring thing in general for patients. Yeah. Okay. One important element is about a third of patients want a caregiver to have access to their notes. I just navigated a, um, a seven-month illness with my 95-year-old father. Um, he, he died at the end of it. But seeing the doctor's notes, because many times when dad would see the doctor, he would come back and say, so what did he say? He'd say, oh, everything's okay. Well, I, I knew everything was not okay. And fortunately, his doctor was very willing to uh, get those notes um, uh, to me. It made a huge difference. Okay, great. If people want to find out more information uh, on the initiative, what, what, what are some of the resources they can go to? Is there a big website for it? Or They can go to opennotes.org and um, find out more information. There's a lot of videos from various perspectives, both the doctor and patient. Yeah. And, and, you know, it would be great uh, if... Uh, they see any mention of open notes in the health system that they're in, start asking for their notes. So, for example, here in the Bay Area, Stanford and the Sutter Health Systems have implemented open notes, and Kaiser and Adventist Systems are thinking about it. Um, patients in those systems uh, need to ask about um, open notes. Uh, where I come from in Oregon, almost all the major systems are doing open notes, but in some cases the patients have to ask how do they see their notes? They need to register for the, in the patient portals. A lot of patients aren't registering in, their, in the portals where all this wonderful information is. So there's a lot that individuals uh, need to do. Great. And as far as patients who are telling their story online, my brain cancer blog is thelizarmy.com, but I'm not the only person who's writing about living with cancer or living with a long-term illness. There are many others, and there are amazing Twitter communities for patients where they can connect with providers and talk about different conditions. And I would definitely look up the healthcare hashtag project where they uh, chronicle and outline all of the different hashtag communities for people with breast cancer, lung cancer, um, you, you name it. And it's an easy way to kind of get in there. So if you get diagnosed with anything in the future, you can actually find a support community that's knowledgeable, that's connecting and seeing um, patients as partners in their own health care. Yeah, well, it, it, we'd definitely love to see, uh, you know, the, the, the technologies and the communities, you know, communities are always, you know, helpful, but, you know, social media and hashtags uh, helping to solve, you know, important issues, uh, you know, looking patient bill of rights way of changing. So thank you all three for, for joining us on this segment, and we'll be back with lots more coverage here from Red Hat Summit. You're watching theCUBE.